Um, so we have two presentations that are coming up next. Um, both USDA and PennVest are going to give us a presentation about their resources that they have and the ways that they um, approach and in some cases incentivize um, regional projects. Um, so we are going to be starting with Tom Wellington, who is an area director from USDA Rural Development in Pennsylvania. Just looking out in the crowd to see who I do not know here. So. <laughs> Probably a lot of people that have seen me before, a lot of these presentations that we've done in the past. Um, I want to take a different slam on this, though. I think I want to get an idea. How many of you even know us? Are you familiar with rural development? Probably have some of our loans and grants worked with us before. Yeah, I'd like to know probably on the back side of this or somewhere along the line um, what the hitches were, customer service-wise what the uh, contentions are, those type of things, what would, what would fix the program, how would it be so much better, that type of stuff. I think from the start here, though, I want to recognize a couple other colleagues that I have in the room here. Some of you may have worked with them. Mary Beth Gianone, who I've worked with forever. Was it three decades? I don't know. Yeah. It's been a long time. 88. <laughs> yeah, and That's... Alyssa Rung, who's in our office over in, uh, in Lycoming. Um, Mary Best over in Mill Hall. And service area wise, the people that cover the territories, if you need a contact, we can get them in touch with you. I think that that's where I'm going to start this, is that I think the most important thing that you can do is get to know who that person is, who the Mary Beth and who the Alyssa's are. Reach out to them, um, make that connection, sit down, talk, at least get them on the phone, maybe do a couple emails, things like that. Um, that's kind of important to get an idea of whether or not your project is eligible, where you're headed with it what you might need from a scope and a PER and an environmental, those type of things. They have a system now called RD Apply, which is electronic, so you can make an application online. I know there might be one or two of you in here that have had a challenge with that system. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than I think what we've had before. What I would encourage you likewise to do, though, again, is reach out to a specialist. I don't think you want to be running around in RD Apply and not know where you're headed, and at least an idea of whether or not the project is essentially eligible. What I'm going to try to do here is give you a, a slant on what I feel is an impact from regionalization. Might be a hit, might be a miss, but the reason being is that if, if Kurt Cocodrilli was up here, he's our state director, he would take off on a vein with all the other programs that we have to offer. I think that's important to start with. Because most of you probably don't know what we have to offer. One of the things that was implemented a few years ago was a stronger economy together. It was not necessarily trying to intervene or circumvent with the, um, the, uh, the strategic planning that maybe EDA had done with the LDDs, with the local development districts. It was to complement it. They actually enhanced it. So what we would do is meet with communities to try to work through plans. Now where I'm headed with that is we now have Strategic Economic Development Initiative, which more or less is a component that we can offer um, an incentive for you with the application process, probably maybe some oh, set-aside funding, those type of things. The idea with that program is, is we take where you're working, we spin off of what you've got as far as maybe an economic development plan. If you don't have an economic development plan, well maybe that's something that could be taken a look at. Communities that we've worked with will work in collaboration with their neighbors to develop that plan. Where I'm headed with that is based upon that plan, if you've worked with your, your SEDs, with your LDDs, that plan has goals. And it also might set those funding opportunities. And at that same time, those are the type of people that you want at the table. You want our people and maybe those other funding opportunities. And to that end, working with that kind of a plan, the, the win on that is our challenge, and I think Mary Beth would agree, not all the time, but in a lot of cases, is you've got the politics of the whole thing. You've got the changes that take place. And, I, and this is probably something that's been discussed already before I got here with, with your vetting some of these things. 
that gives to be a big challenge because we'll start a project, we'll be halfway through it, and then the politics change with the, with the township or the borough. We're headed a different direction. My feeling is, and based upon what I've seen so far with these plans, when somebody actually sits down and puts together a comprehensive strategic plan of some sort, even on a local level, that, it's, that's a map. That's something that folks can go back to and say, well, where are you at with this? How can we make this fit? So that would be one of my contentions. When the 2014 Farm Bill came out, that was where what we call the uh, Strategic Economic Community Development uh, Initiative came out. And we worked with several communities on that to the end of saying, okay, what kind of a plan do you have? Where do we fit in? What component do we come into play there? How can we help you with funding? The spinoff on that, though, was what we recently did up in Tioga County. And I want to give you that as an example, and I want to spin off on some of the funding opportunities we've been able to offer them. And that was the Rural Economic Development Initiative. We were able to actually make them an awardee for that program, Tioga County in general. And we have the Tioga uh, Development Corporation up there that we work with in conjunction with the communities in general. Um, the whole concept there is, is from an economic development standpoint. And the idea is it's, it's, an, it's an initiative that they will put this down on paper and say this is where they're going to head over the, over the course of the future as far as where their opportunities would be for development and economic development in general based upon measurements, based upon economic progress, it's all tracked as far as their objectives. The idea here is basically to try to address some of those challenges that we have with the local municipalities and the local politicals as far as trying to get stuff done. That we're actually putting it down, we're saying this is where we're going to head and these are the funding opportunities that we're available. That doesn't lock and load our money by any means. That doesn't necessarily mean we're setting funds aside for anything. It's just a, it's just a priority type of, of, of a program. So when we're looking at that, we're looking at the collaboration, the relationships, trying to develop that trust, which is so, it, it's so tough for us. We go into a community and developing that trust takes so much of our time as well as what you're, you're probably here today hearing. But obviously, and I think we've just heard that in this presentation, you're going to hear that time and time again. When you've got that collaboration, and you've got people pulling together, and you've got those, uh, those economic development plans, You've got that said. You basically have something that is based upon increased efficiencies, lower costs, reliable service, all that good stuff. The synergy that you have between the, uh, the various uh, townships and the municipalities when you're forming an authority, which we work with lots of authorities. That's just the type of stuff we do. If we have to go into the weeds as far as explaining how you can structure that, that's a Mary Beth. That's an Alyssa Rum that you would be working with to work that out, to run those numbers to say, okay, these are the communities we want to bring together. How does that component work for our funding? So when we got into those communities, when we got into Tioga County, I, actually I was impressed with what happened and what happened before actually we got there. Some of the things that we were able to do with Tioga County, and, and uh, Mary Beth is now working up there on a project as well, and we have an existing one we're working through with Lossburg. But you know, may not be entirely familiar with Tioga County, but let me just bet some of this a while. The things we're going to do from a funding standpoint, and I just want to give you a flavor for the other things we do, Harbor Counseling, which was a drug rehab uh, facility. We were able to fund a facility up there. The Dean Center, which is the entertainment center up there. Because they're a nonprofit, we were able to help them out with some improvements to the uh, property up there. The Grand Canyon Airport, it was a community facility one. We were able to help them out with some improvements to the airport. The Tannery, which is out Westfield Way, if you're familiar with that area at all, we're involved there with uh, uh, Appalachian Regional uh, Commission uh, as a BFA, as the, uh, uh, the funding agency to administer the funds out there. Tioga Barrel in, in, in general has a sewer loan with us. Stony Fork, Fork and Delmar had loans in the past. Knoxville, Elkland, Lawrenceville. I, I can go on and on about the impact we have from an economic standpoint. Many of these were based upon those type of plannings that had been done, saying that, okay, we're going to try to get rural development in the room and see how that component will work from a funding standpoint. Now, versus all of that, which you've heard here and you folks have been talking about, how do we get the regionalization together? How do we pull this all uh, together and make it happen? How do we get those projects together so we can cut the costs and we can increase the efficiency, make it a win all the way around? You've got the smaller units, you've got the smaller projects, you've got the smaller communities, and that's the stuff we do every day, day in, day out. We realize there's those communities 
that are basically isolated. They're the islands, and those are the things that we work with. First of all, I'm not going to say we're an entire grant program. I'm going to say from the get-go, we're a loan program first, and we look on the grant on the backside. What we do feel is that regionalization is a win. It's a big win all the way around. And like I say, we do a lot of these from the standpoint of, of authorities combining the forces as far as the townships and the boroughs. So what I would ask again, and I'm, I'm probably going to say this several times, and Mary Beth will be a champion for this. If you're thinking about reaching out to us, if you think we need to be a component, we need to be in the room to talk to you, first of all, we encourage that. We would love that opportunity. But the other thing is I want to encourage you to reach out to a specialist, meet with them, or at least have them in the room, or talk to them about what that project is. So what we do, and I think you already know that, is we finance uh, water and wastewater disposal uh, projects. That's, that's our thing. That's our shtick. Has been for years. Right now, based upon the budget that we got, $1.4 billion. Now it's nationwide, that's not the end game. There might be more funds available, but that's loan money. The grant component, which usually we're dealing with maybe a 70-30 split on loan to grant, and that's not for everybody because it all depends on the MHI, the medium household income. And we look at basically what we're looking at from a population standpoint too, because we still have that 10,000 population. I'll revisit that in a second. 443 million in grant. So the component on the grant obviously is less. Is all that set in stone? I don't know. This administration is big time on infrastructure. So we might see more funding available. Might be something where we find more funds that we can get from the national office or we can capture it from other states that aren't using it. So it's always good to have us in the room. It's always good to make us part of the game. So the direct funding, which is what I was just talking about from the 10,000 population limit, that's pretty much set. But the interesting thing is, is over the course of last year, they've made 50,000 on population doable with a guarantee. There's obviously the stipulations on that. You have to have a lender that's interested. In, is it competitive? Honestly, probably in Pennsylvania, you're going to find a shortfall there because of the interest rates and the fact that we don't guarantee tax exempt issuance. But might it work? I don't know. Where it would work? Possibly in the case of, and I use Williamsport as an example because that's, that's where I've been stationed for years, and those are projects that we did in and around there, and I think if there's any of you in the room from that area, you realize that. Williamsport is an area that is not eligible for the program. But if you take the 50,000 population limit with a guarantee, maybe we could do a guarantee in Williamsport, for example, and then we could do components of the outskirts of, of Williamsport. For instance, we did Southside. We did the uh, Little League area. South Williamsport. We did a Lycoming, Linden. There was projects around Williamsport we did with the direct program. So what I'm thinking is if you have a component that might fit, and I don't know if you'll have a competitive interest rate because I don't know what the banks would come in at. We have a bank now, Live Oak, that's nationwide, that is interested in doing stuff with us. I have reached out to them recently and say, well, what's your interest rate structure going to be like? I'm just saying, you got an area like that where you have an area that's um, technically ineligible from the direct standpoint. The population doesn't hit that 10,000. But you've got components around it that are regionalization. Is there a way to make stuff like that work? And I'm just throwing out some thoughts here, food for thoughts, things to maybe say, hey, you know, maybe this would work in our area, or maybe it would. So we're dealing with eligible applicants, which you're aware of. Most of this you could tell me. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. As far as public bodies, municipalities, counties, townships, nonprofits, we can do that. Um, one of our specialists up in um, Monroe County, I'm not sure if it's Monroe or Pike County that we're working on the project. There's an a, 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 a association up there that we're working with right now. So there's things that we can do from that standpoint too, so it's not strictly uh, municipal. The projects have to be designed with adequate capacity consistent with the development plans. Like I said earlier, we do have a guaranteed component now. The population base is based upon the census, so that is the critical component, and I think you've heard that. I don't know, if, if they could do anything as far as selling that, as far as coming on board with the, uh, with the census, because I know in my own backyard they have a little bit of an issue right now with the population understanding how critical it is to answer those questions. Federal programs all based upon that. And I've seen the ouch in that, too, from the income standpoint. Uh, the, the ouch being the income was projected so high, perhaps because of what may have been that short-term uh, spot where they took the population, and it ran it right up, and they're no longer eligible for grant, may not even be eligible for most of the program. So it's critical that people respond to the census, make sure that data gets, gets reported. <clears throat> Interest rate. Which I'm forgetting the slide here, I hope I can work this out. 
Well, there, there's an overview of what we do, which I think you know, all of these things. The solid waste disposal component, once a year, usually around uh, October, November, December, they come out with this program, which incidentally, RCAP, I think you know this, they, they get a good uh, uh, piece of money from, from us to do stuff like this, to do the training component technical assistance. Um, what they do with that program anyway, to get back to it, is basically, you might have a community that needs to do something with their uh, uh, abating some of the problems of the landfill, maybe a recycling program, things like that. There is not a lot of money available in this program. Sadly, it seems that Pennsylvania, I'm not saying they uh, discount us, but basically it's, it's a challenge. Because it's so competitive, we don't seem to get a lot of these funded. So anyway, you're talking drinking water, sanitary, uh, sewer, the, the storm drainage, we can do those type of things. And then in the middle there, we tuck that, uh, that's the solid waste. <coughs> Again, these are the things that we do as far as what we fund. Construction, obviously just about everything. There's some short changes on those, some things that we cannot do. And there it gives you a brief overview of some of the things in the weeds. So the interest rate was what I wanted to get into here, just to show you that structure. That's where it's at now. Guess what? It's going down based upon what I've seen, which is great. Um, poverty, the subset on that, and it's based upon the medium household income, is based upon having a, um, an, or an order of some sort in most cases. Uh, documentation could be a little tough if you don't have a notice of violation or a consent order, but it's possible. We, obviously, we've done these things. Um, that's where it's structured down. I'm telling you, this is going down probably April uh, 1st. Every three months, this is adjusted. It's based upon the uh, <coughs> bond issuance. So that, that's good to know. I mean, you've got some good rates there. Are you going to get a project through overnight? I think you all realize that doesn't happen. These things are slow in developing. There's a lot of going back and forth. We have to have a preliminary engineering report. You have to have that, that scope, that 537, if we're doing a sewer project, obviously can be used for that, but it usually has amendments to, amendments to it. And then you've also got the environmental component, which I think most of you realize from our program standpoint, is a little bit involved. It's not just a regular unified environmental report. I'll get into the weeds a little bit there, a little bit later here. The loan program grant component, the grant is based upon the medium household income and the availability of funds. The rates are comparable to other systems. That's what we compare it to. So we're looking at other systems. We're not giving you any more than what we would give something across the board. The grant funds are based upon a final underwriting. So when we go through it, basically we're going to re-crunch those numbers, make sure it all makes sense, make sure it's all competitive, that we're not dealing with somebody getting something that isn't a similar system. And the documentation I said on the property rate, ultimately based upon whether or not we've got some kind of a consent order or health violation before we go that route. The loans are closed at the lower of the two of the rates that it would be locked in, or if the rate is lower at the time of closing, which is a, which is a win. That that's a good thing. Um, and the median household income, based again upon the census, and I can't overemphasize the need for folks to report that stuff. I have a question. Sure. Unless we should wait to the end. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm good. Um, the, the census that you're using to determine this, and I agree, <clears throat> census is out right now. It's very important to get your communities to do that. 2010. I'm wondering, um, for other funding agencies, we're able to do a survey. Um, you know, you follow a survey methodology. If the census data doesn't seem <clears throat> strong in the area, there's been some sort of impacts. What's USDA's outlook on that? You can do it. It's, it's tough. We're going to need some documentation on that. It's been few and far between. And I'm just going to tell you quite candidly, I haven't, I'm just telling you, haven't had a lot of success with that, but you can do it, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're thinking of going that route, if you've got some solid reason why it needs to be taken a look at that way, let's see that data and talk it out a little bit. I'm not going to say it's a gimme. And sometimes it goes the other way. So you just got to be cautious with that. And sometimes it's a real wrestle because people don't... But, as with the census, they don't cooperate. So, but if you, if you want to go there, maybe we need to talk about that. Thank you. And if I'm going over here, somebody stop me, put up the stop sign. Um, the maximum term is 40 years. Now, some of that I think you know if you're a township. It depends on what that, um, and that was the other thing I didn't mention. Interim financing is what we work with. Interim financing may affect your term. Um, it could be 37 years. I don't know. It's depending on what the length of that interim financing are and how long the construction takes. And that is what we use. Go back to that. We close this on the backside. So what we're looking for is an interim lender to be able to assist you during a period of construction. Then we come in on the backside, we take that out. We go ahead and basically close it at that point. Security, 
Obligation bonds are great. Revenue bonds, um, what we're looking at is assessments, revenues for nonprofits. Might be a mortgage if we're dealing with that type of a situation. We don't do a lot of nonprofits or uh, associations, I'm just going to tell you up front. Um, RD apply, I mentioned that. Best practice, the specialist. You need to re reach out to them and, and get in touch with them and early in the game, basically <coughs> as early as possible. We'd like to know who your engineer are, who's going to be doing the environmental. The environmental, incidentally, is the National uh, Environmental Protection Policy Act, and basically that means we're going to be going deep into the weeds. Uh, we're not going to be converting wetlands, we're not going to be doing archaeological problems, we're not going to be do, uh, uh, violating historical properties. So there's going to be a little bit of vetting. We have a state environmental coordinator who's right there to help. Our contention is now what we would like to do from the get-go is get that SEC out, the state environmental coordinator, and the engineer from the beginning of the game to basically look at what you're dealing with, talk to you, so it's all full disclosure from that front. Rather than get into it, have you submitting stuff, especially now with RD Apply, because you can do it 24-7. I've seen some stuff come through at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm just saying that you're better to work it through our local office yet and then go into RD Apply, which is pretty much mandatory. We utilize the engineers joint contract committee documents. Um, basically, we um, want to see any of your existing or proposed inter-municipal uh, agreements. That would be a gimme. And like I said, it would be the plenary engineering report and or if you have a 537, and there's going to probably end up being amendments to the 537 plan. Um, so, I think I'm pretty much going to wrap it up there. That gives you a quick overview of where we're at. The thing I want to emphasize is there's so much more that we have to offer. There's other programs that we bring to the table that are not necessarily going to meet maybe your particular project that you're working on right now, but it might meet the other stuff you're doing. If you're part of a township, municipality, even an authority, we might be able to offer that much more. What I'm going to do, though, is ask Mary Beth, is there anything we need to add? Um, outside the table, I have um, a map that actually has the specialist's name and contact information. All you have to do is find the county you're in, and it'll tell you what specialist to contact if you have a project. There's also the uh, general rural development program guide. That this every program we do, there's like over, over like 40 of them. We don't do a lot of them locally. So um, normally the ones locally would be our sewer and water. Also, we have a community facility program uh, that's done more locally. Um, and then I have a fact sheet for the community facility program, as well as the... Um, water and wastewater back sheet. So. I'm not trying to, um, to get everyone to uh, be the Debbie Downer here, but uh, Mary Beth is planning on wrapping it up here within the next year, but that's where I have, that's where I have Alyssa to come on board to step up to the plate. So. All, all good for the time being? I'm sorry. Uh, so questions for Tom? I could probably hear you. Yeah, well, do you, do you, are you seeing um, the broadband or rural broadband? Are you seeing a lot of action on that in Pennsylvania? I was just about to ask that question. Is any engineers out there that can work broadband? Because I've got a small group out in uh, Youngsville that is interested in bringing an engineer on board, as a matter of fact. So are we seeing a lot? I'll tell you the short change on broadband is it doesn't, first of all, okay, we, we don't seem to have... Um, those people climbing on board. We need somebody, we need a buy-in. And there isn't. I'm just going to be candid with you. There's, there's a, one or two, Youngsville, it, uh, Youngsville applied before, I think I can say that. Youngsville is the only one right now that has an interest. When they came out with the, um, oh, um, the, the, the Tri-County took it. The, um, the, the, anyway, when they came out with that package, oh, and incidentally, Tri-County, which I don't know if you guys realize this, but they got a broadband initiative going up north there. They were borrow bars. So that's how good this is. Rural development and, and going back to the Farmers Home Administration sunk a ton of money out there in rural America, and that's just the shtick we do. Anywho, yeah. So the shortfall on that is, first of all, we don't have, no one's buying in. Now, obviously, the Verizons and the Frontiers, I mean, really? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the profitability angle, too. And that's coming up on a deadline here, isn't it? It's like the 16th. I think it's now. That's that, this second round that went through. Will it get better? They, they, this is just my opinion. There might have to be some tweaking to that to make it more acceptable. 
Um, but that's where it's at right now. It's not that we don't have the broadband out there. We have that reconnect program that's right there in the forefront. The other thing we do, which if you get a chance, and I failed to mention this, is what's called a distance learning telemedicine program. I think it's a great product. That, that right there, when you look at that product and figure out what you can do with it, it's only a 15% um, uh, match. It, hospitals, um, schools, you know, that type of stuff, you want to do some remote, and now, even more important than ever, when you consider what we're going through right now with the uh, corona, I mean, remote, how good is all that? And, and they put quite a bit of money into that this year, incidentally. So I, I'm, that's a sidebar thing. That's just a sales pitch for the DLT. And I'm sorry, I'm, i got to get off here so Dave can get up here because he'll hit me. Go ahead. I just want to make a comment on the broadband. I just want to make a comment on the broadband. I got gotcha. you. We are currently in an eight county broadband project. It's going. It's also here with us. Bedford, we have Blair, Bedford, Corner uh, Fed, Cambria, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the, we've looked at the reconnect program because you know, we're going to end up probably doing a cooperative um, in our area. Good, yeah. But I think one of the issues that's coming up, and of course, it's also came up with. Um, the other um, uh, changes is it's looking at 10 1. Um, so that is a problem. Um, and I know it's probably because of the competition with the other um, uh, uh, WISPs that are already in place. Um, you know, the Verizons, um, the CenturyLinks, uh, uh, Atlantic Broadband, uh, Comcast. But, you know, when we're trying to find a spot for, you know, as a cooperative or as any other um, uh, WISP that come into place, trying to put into broadband into place in those areas. We're going to have to have 10 1, and then uh, even when we're looking at an ARC application, we have to show they can change theirs to 10 1. And so then we, if we have somebody that wants to fight a Verizon or CenturyLink or anybody that says, no, we, can, we are getting 10 1, even though the people in those homes are saying we're only getting 5, um, we have to then have a third party come in and show that they are not producing that speed. So, I mean, that's one of the problems that we are seeing um, with our broadband, with you know, using the reconnect and other programs. And, and you know what I think I need to do, and maybe you want to, um, maybe you want to reconnect with me. Um, is give me your pass along, pass along your information because what I would like to do, I'm not going to say it's going to have. Um, a, look, I mean, I we we're not the legislators, all right. So there's so much, so there's only so far I can go with this. But what I could do with that is I could pass it along to our general field rep and tell him this is a contention, this is a concern. In addition to our state director who Kirk Cocadrilli is quite adamant right now about trying to push broadband energy and this program right here, water and waste. That's, that's his shtick right now. So I know there's shortfalls on that reconnect. Maybe they could tweak something. Um, part of it was just that. It, what, when you went for the grant component, you, if, everybody would, if everybody in the area, could, you couldn't have anybody in the area that was getting anything. That's what it came down to. Otherwise, it threw that application out. So it was a little bit too restrictive. Whether or not they light, lighten up on that, I don't know. But something co-ops, that's the other thing we plan on doing over the course of the next year. We're going to make the rounds again to the electric co-ops to see if there's any buy-in there. Now, I know there's some limitations, but we want to do that. We want to say, hey, look. And that <coughs> might include Tri-County, but Tri-County's already got that Connect America fund that they're working with. So, When do you expect to switch over to the 2020 census data? I don't know. You? No, it was supposed to be two years ago. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to go to the, there was a, we're using the 6 to the 10, and then there's like the 11 to 15. We never, we think we just skipped right over that. We're still using this old one. So, I, I wish have I, no I, idea. I wish, I wish <laughs> there were so many things I wish I had answers on as far as when. Well, that's going to be a, and that's a big difference when Dave gets up to talk. We use different sets of data. So. I heard from the crystal ball that it's maybe like 2022. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about money. Data. I think it's all about money. Yeah. <laughs> that's bad. Okay. Um, any other questions for Tom? Yeah. And you can reach out to us. Please do so. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.